The year is 480 BC in the region of Phocis. There is a small pass near the river Phoenix. Here we can see 4,200 Greek soldiers from 10 different regions of Greece defending a wall built into this narrow pass. They are standing waiting to clash against the invading forces of Xerxes, a three million strong army that had one goal, to conquer Greece. This is the Battle of Thermopylae, the climax of the Persian Wars. But you might be wondering, how did we get here? Hello and welcome to the AIQ podcast. I'm Alexander Goodman and on this episode we are talking about the Greco-Persian Wars, where the Persian Empire invaded the Greek mainland and tried to sack the city of Athens. So what is the Persian Wars? As I've just said, it was a war between the the Achaemenid Empire of Persia and the Greek city-states. This war lasted from 499 BC to 449 BC, and it was fought over many different areas, including Greece, Macedon, Asia Minor, Thrace, and then later on, even Egypt and Cyprus. But, as most of you probably would be wondering, how did this even happen? How can you have a war that lasted so long uh, in so many different areas when it started with just the invasion just of the Greek mainland? How did it get out to Egypt and Cyprus? That makes no sense. Well, let's go answer that. So, the start of the conflict occurred when Athens persuaded an Ionian Greek settlement, which is uh, a Greek colony inside Asia Minor that was established by Greeks and then got taken over by the Persian Empire. And so the Persians then in, in place their own rule onto that onto that, that Greek colony. Well, Athens persuaded them, the Ionian Greeks, to rebel against the Persian rule that had been established by Cyprus the Great when Asia Minor was conquered. However, during this time period, Cyrus actually died and so... King Darius came up, who was a new king of the Persian Empire, and he decided to respond to this, and he went to quell this revolt in 499 BC, which is the start of this war. So he went over there and he started subduing the Ionians. However, he seeked revenge on Athens for causing this rebellion and causing such problems in his empire. So he wanted to go over and take revenge on the Athenians and sack their city, effectively. And so that meant the invasion of Thrace happened in 492 BC. So Thrace is an area just above Greece, uh, next to Macedon, uh, where modern-day Istanbul is. Um, At this time period, it was quite a tribal area. There wasn't a lot of well-established cities there. During this invasion of Thrace, then, Darius managed to reclaim his authority over the areas of Thrace and Macedon, but he never made it into Greece itself. With the ending of his campaign gathering what he had in Macedon and Thrace, he decided that that wasn't enough. And then on his next campaign, he decided he was going to reach Athens and he was going to invade with the intent of actually making it to Greece this time. So on this campaign, Darius made really good progress. He went to the coast of Asia Minor, modern day Turkey, and he island hopped around the islands of the Aegean to get to the Greek mainland. And as he went through these Greek islands, he conquered and subdued most of them he'd done really really well but his problem was when he landed inside greece itself see when he landed he landed in an area called attica which is the region around modern day athens and it was effectively a polis of athens and i'm going to explain polises later on in more depth but quickly right now a polis is effectively an area around a city which that city has complete control over It is effectively its own region. When Darius landed in Attica, he landed at a little place near Marathon, where the Greek army, or the Athenian army, was waiting for him, where Darius suffered a a really bad defeat, where his infantry were completely routed and most of them cut down or taken as slaves. Later on, in 486 BC, Darius dies while preparing to quell another revolt, but this time in Egypt. This meant Xerxes then rose to the throne, and after he dealt with the Egyptian revolt, he turned his attention back to Greece. And eventually, after four years of detailed planning, Xerxes Xerxes forces assembled at the town of Abydos, which is the town closest in Asia Minor 
to um, the Hellespont in Greece. The Hellespont is a strip of water between modern day Turkey and nowadays Greece. Um, and at that point, it was under the kind of uh, region of Thrace. Uh, but it's a really small strip of water that was very important for trade and for getting from the Black Sea into the Mediterranean. So what Xerxes did to get over this Hellespont was he created a floating bridge made from boats. And this is very famous in history. He tied boats together, one after another, to make a bridge to cross it. He didn't sail across it. He walked his army across this bridge, which was a massive feat for the time. And at this point, Xerxes', Xerxes invasion had begun. It is, th it is at this point where we now see the first resistance from the Greeks as a united state. Their first conflict happened at the Battle of Thermopylae, where Xerxes and his three million man army, which is now contested, um, we get three million from Herodotus, um, however, it's not always believed that this is an accurate number, and it is also the, uh, the Greeks are also not to think of an, uh, being an accurate number either, but uh, I'm gonna run with it because this is what Herodotus says, our ancient source. The Persian army marches with Xerxes through the pass of Thermopylae to meet its foe that is waiting there, a unified section of Greece. However, the Greeks pull up a really good fight for a few days, but alas, they were defeated as the Persians managed to flank round using information they had got from Greek spies effectively they were they were sort of spies, but they were also exiles. It's quite confusing. We'll talk about it more later. This flank by the Persian army was crucial to the defeat at Thermopylae, where the Greeks knew that they were outnumbered and outmatched, and they decided to retreat. However, there were some that decided to sacrifice themselves to allow the, allow the other sections of the army to retreat without being cut down. So, at this point, you had the famous 300 Spartans alongside the Thespian army standing there waiting to die with honour, as Herodotus says. There was also the Thebans there who stayed because supposedly they were made to. I don't believe that, but supposedly they were made to by Leonidas um, and they were the first to um, give up and become prisoners. But nonetheless, these soldiers stayed and they fought to the bitter end. With the defeat of Thermopylae, the road to Athens was opened, something that Xerxes relished. He wanted to do what Darius tried, and that was to punish Athens. And now he could. There was nothing stopping him. So Xerxes marched on Athens, attacked it, and then plundered it. The reason why Athens was open is because the Peloponnesian Greeks decided to abandon Athens and move to the Isthmus of Corinth, where they could hold another defence like Thermopylae. Xerxes wished to end the war soon and push his fleet to engage the Athenian fleet and use his own fleet against the Peloponnesian Greeks who now hold Corinth. He believed that if he could sail around and start attacking the mainland Peloponnese, the Greeks had to retreat from the pass that they were now holding, which would mean Xerxes had a much better chance of defeating them. However, something Xerxes didn't think would happen occurred. The Athenians defeated his own fleet at the Battle of Salamis. This destroyed the Persian su superiority in the sea and was potentially the biggest blow they had had yet received as the Persian Empire. This caused Xerxes to retreat with a large amount of his forces back to Asia Minor, as he was worried that the Athenian fleet would now go and destroy his pontoon bridge he created to cross the Hellespont, and therefore be trapped in Greece. However, some forces did remain in Greece over the winter to continue the campaign against against the united Greeks. After the winter, the Greeks attained victory over the Persians at the Battle of Plataea. At this point, the war started to turn with the Greeks becoming aggressive. They managed to force the Persians out of Greece completely, as well as Macedon and Thrace. With these victories, the Greeks then continued their ambitions and they formed a dealing league where Athens and its allies created a structure much like per, uh, Sparta had with uh, the Peloponnesian city-states. The dealing league then pushed on 
and continued the conflict with Persia. However, at this point, the Spartans and the Peloponnesian League decided to not inju- uh, not join in with this endeavour, as they believed the purpose of unifying as the Greeks was purely for defence, and now Athens and the Delian League had evidently shown that they wanted to go onto the offensive outside of the Greek world, which the Spartans and Peloponnesian League could not back. The war, therefore, between the Delian League and the Persians continued for some time, with the Delian League eventually fighting in Egypt and Cyprus. However, at the Battle of Salamis in Cyprus, not the one in Greece, the end of the war was near, where we are not sure, but there was either a peace treaty signed or both um, both the, the Persian Empire and the Dean League decided to cease hostilities. So now we're all caught up with the Persian Wars and what happened. Let's start trying to think of what we can learn from this and how uh, this account of history can, uh, can teach us about how these two societies worked. So let's start with the Greeks. So one of the main things about the Greeks which is interesting during this episode is the fact that they unified together to expel the Persian forces from the Greek mainland and that shows us two things it shows something about the Greek identity and then how Greeks work together so the Greeks typically organize themselves in individual city-states and these are called polices and I'm going to explain this now I talked about it earlier So a polis is effectively a city. So, for instance, Athens, where everyone inside that city is part of this polis. Because a polis is not just about a geographical location like a city. It's also a political entity where uh, where Athens has control over the people in that place because they are Athenians, different to, like, let's say, Spartans. They're both Greeks, but they're... They're in different policies, so they have different control and they have different political alignments. And it's this manner of policy systems where the Greeks would categorise themselves and see each other. So, for instance, if I was a Corinthian, I would look at someone who's a Spartan and I wouldn't say we are both Greeks. I would say I'm a Corinthian and he's a Spartan. We are different and we're from different regions and we have different politics and different political ideologies. However, saying that, what is interesting is during the Persian Wars, this isn't the case, where different policies could look at each other and be like, we are not the same, but still recognise they are Greek and then unify under this Greek identity, not just their own polis identities, which was previously the case. So why is there this shift and change in the political organisation of the Greek world? Um, Because during the Persian Wars, what would happen before is that, let's say, the Peloponnesian League, if if they had a a victory in a uh, in a pitched battle, it wouldn't be so much like the Peloponnesian League won or the Greeks won. It'd be that city-state inside of it so let's say sparta sparta would be put down as the the victor not the league as a whole it was still very individualized however this is a shift now where for instance the battle marathon although it was an athenian win it was recorded and celebrated as a greek win that change of individuality and the separate identities changed to this now unified ethnicity of being Greek. I would argue that the reason as to why the Greek city-states united against the Persians was purely for defensive reasons. It was only when the Persian Empire attempted to invade the Greek mainland itself that most of the city-states became active in the war. They weren't, uh, on Darius's invasion, they weren't participating as Darius has only got to Thrace and Macedon. It was it's clear that the distinction of when this uni- united group happens is when there's a threat to the Greeks' city-states themselves. And it's also seen by 
on the expulsion of the Persians from Greece, it becomes clear that the primary function of the League was to defend from the Persian invasion, because the Spartans and the Peloponnesian League decided to end hostilities with Persia and not continue the war, while the Delian League, very interestingly, continues to harass the Persians outside the Greek world, um, specifically in Cyprus and Egypt. So you can see there's now a division where this unified Greek state had become back to its sort of interchange in politics where they would use their polis states independently from each other. They are no longer agreed on a purpose or a function of the war. So that begs the question, if the Greeks only band together against the Persians in order to defend against the invasion, what were they defending? So it's clear that from well, I believe it's clear that it was for defensive purposes because half half of the participants decided to stop when Greece was no longer under threat. But that does pose the question: Are they are they defending Greece as a geographical location, like the whole of Greece? Are they do they care? Do people care about all the other city states inside of Greece, or have they got alternative reasons for doing it? Is it a much more selfish? reason or a polis driven reason are they doing it for their allies are they doing it for themselves or alternatively is there a much more abstract reason you know there's a few things that it potentially could be i would argue that the greeks are defending an ally in themselves against the persians not to defend a greek state because there is no greek state this is the first time we've seen them band together so it's it's clear that there is actually no infrastructure there for this to continue um, there is no greek state there are just the greek people but i don't think that's why they're doing it i also don't think they're doing it to protect allies because for instance sparta and athens have a very heated history and they are full of hostilities, or even Sparta and the Argives, I don't think that they would unite together to expel this enemy because they were looking out for each other, because in no other time in history do they do this. This is a strange abnormality. Um, so I don't think it's that either. What I believe it is, is that the Greeks are banding together to protect the Greek way of life, and more specifically, Greek autonomy, the ability for the Greek city-states to rule themselves. Th with having Persia come in, and this is really well seen through the Ionian Greeks that we talked about earlier, which is the very, very start of the Persian Wars, the Ionian Greeks were a polis system and they could rule themselves in their own policies and they could function independently. But with the Persian Empire coming in and taking control of them, they no longer had that ability and they were ruled by Persian elites and so they could no longer have their own autonomy. They were ruled and they were oppressed and the Greeks didn't want that because the Greeks only function as they do because they have their autonomy and it's something that they can't and will not give up. Alternatively, it could not just be having the idea of having their own autonomy, but it could also be about defending Greek culture because we know that the Persians and the Greeks are very different in cultures and they have different characteristics and they have different ways of functioning. Their court systems are different. Their, the way they maintain themselves is very different. The way they enact themselves and their morals are different. So it could be to defend against their culture, but that begs the question as to what did the Greeks think of the Persian Empire and their culture? And was that really so opposite in their own values and way of life and customs that that would cause them to unite and go to war? Could it really be that different? But we're going to explore that question now because it might genuinely be true that because they were different, they went to war. So let's look at what the Greeks think about the Persians and what we get from the sources that are available to us. So it's clear we we have to make the distinction first of all that most of our information comes from the Greeks and the Greek sources 
and we are not sure uh, when they are because most of the sources are dated well all the sources are dated after the Persian Wars happened so it's difficult to say if the opinions were there at the time of the Persian Wars or if it is being created and spread after the Persian Wars when these sources are starting to be written down but nonetheless what our sources do tell us is that the Greeks viewed the Persians as opposites so for instance the Greeks thought of themselves as masculine and strong, as characteristics. But they also valued things like autonomy of the polis, uh, liberty of the individual, um, and their own real identity. What's interesting is they believe the opposite for the Persians. So they see the Persians as effeminate and weak, um, the opposite of masculine and strong. And they see the Persians as authoritarian and corrupt tyrants, which would evidently destroy their own values of, which I've just said, of liberty of the person, kind of freedom, autonomy of their own policy system as well. So let's first start looking at with the sources, the femininity of the Persians and the masculinity of the Greeks. So it's quite a significant aspect uh, because it's quite discussed and talked about by our sources. So the first one is by Xenophon on his Education of Cyrus, which he describes and talks about how due to corrupt taxation and overbearing tyranny of the Persians, the Persians had become so afraid of their own government that they were too scared to enlist in the military and so the forces became smaller and they became weaker and more cowardly uh, as a result. But it's, it's important to just quickly state that the um, Education of Cyrus is largely fiction, fictional, um, if not entirely so, and this should be take, shouldn't be taken as fact. Instead, it shows us how Greeks viewed pay, uh, Persian society, um, or at least how Xenophon viewed it. This may not be something that was widely believed. Um, Xenophon was a Greek who wasn't actually paid by the Persians when he was a mercenary. So there are definitely things that could bring him to be biased and we have to take this account with a pinch of salt. Um it could be it it could be uh could be real and what he's saying could be true, but it could be exaggerated. Or alternatively it could be all fictional. We don't know. Another source we have is Arian's Anabasis of Alexander the Great, where it was made quite a while after uh, the Persian Wars. It was created in the second century AD, um, and so evidently is quite quite far into the future after this event. And he doesn't specifically talk about the Persian Wars itself, but he references them. So, at the Battle of Issus, Alexander gives a pre-battle speech, which is very common, uh, in which he plays on the idea of the Persian femininity, which is evident also in Xenophon and how the Greeks are much stronger and braver than they are and so they must win they there's no way they can lose because the Persian Empire is just full of cowards and of course the Greeks are strong and and true and so he plays on this um, quite effectively and in the end they do win the battle so what he what he actually says in the text though i'm going to read it out uh word for word so just bear with me so so alexander in his speech says that the persian army would be no match for his macedonian army in bodily strength or resolution and that his enemy who was the medes and the persians had long lived luxurious lives and were not equipped for war um, like the Macedonians or Greeks, the Macedonian Greeks were hardened men, and the Persians were soft. They, they had every, they had the comfort there. They didn't have to work for it, but the Greeks did, and that made them stronger, not just uh, strong as physical, but stronger mentally and and characteristic wise. So our third and final source is Plato in the Laws, where he describes how the Persians are in a very similar way to the other sources, in which he says that the Persian rulers were of, often so decadent and corrupt and tyrannical. So he refers to this, and this is a quote, this is not me saying this, but womanish education um, as the reason for this, further associating them with 
femininity rather than masculinity, which back then, femininity was definitely seen as a negative, at least in Greece. We don't know about other areas, but at least in Greece, masculinity was far, far superior. So now we'll go to not the masculinity anymore. We're going to go to the tyranny of the Persians and the lack of liberty among their citizens compared to the Greeks who are fully autonomous, as we believe. So again, we see this in Xenophon and Plato. So Xenophon, in his Education of Cyrus, writes that the reason for this cowardice and weakness of the Persians was because the people feared the tyranny and corruption of their rulers. This Xenophon attributes to the corrupting influence of wealth and power that the Persian elites were exposed to from a very young age, which caused them to become decadent and immoral. Thus, they could not govern themselves correctly because the Persian Empire, as we know, had such vast amounts of land. It went from Asia Minor all the way to Bactria, which is nowadays Pakistan and Afghanistan, that that sort of region. So they had a lot of variety in their empire, which uh, was could be easily traded around. Um, and there was a, a huge amount of wealth, which is seen by when Alexander the Great, later on, not in the Persian Wars, but when Alexander the Great defeats uh, Darius, he finds his treasury. So in Darius's bedroom in one of his notorious cities, he finds 10 times the amount of money that Athens would make annually in its peak prime period, which is incredible, just laying around in his bedroom. This is the sort of wealth that is being accumulated in Persia compared to the Greeks. And this is what Xenophon's playing on as how they can function correctly with organising cities and governing. Because when there's money, there is corruption. And so they were not seeking to be the best that these could be, but just to be the most wealthy. Plato also picks up on this idea that Xenophon was on about... Um, about the Persians being tyrannical and not being able to uh, lead and govern correctly. And he believes that it comes back from what he describes, and this is quote again, from the womanish education that the Persians have. He believes that it gives, these, this education gives some elements such as the femininity and the others that we previously talked about, which means that they are corrupt and less powerful morally to be able to make decisions that the Greeks would evidently be able to do. Plato even goes as far in his laws because uh, the, the way that his book works is it's, it's about how best to govern and to rule and laws to enact and such and such. And he uses the Persians as an example of how power goes too far and how tyranny, ty ty tyranny and corruption can lead to the downfall of societies. So with having multiple people really pushing this idea of the Persians as corrupt and um, not being able to govern correctly, you really do get an idea that this, this actually could be quite an ingrained idea and it could, you know, in a way, be quite truthful that the, the method of governing between the very autonomous polis states of the Greeks compared to the massive empire uh, where power is delegated down to individuals of the Persian Empire. It may be at this time the conception that th the Greeks, I've got a superior um, uh, governing mechanism, could definitely be about and could, could evidently be a rife ideology, an idea that's been spreading around the Greek world. So now we looked at the Greek opinion on Persians, let's flip this around, let's look at the Persian opinion on the Greeks um, and themselves, which would be quite interesting. So unfortunately, it is difficult to say with certainly how the Persians view the Greeks, it is easy to say that they probably would of dislike them at least during the Persian Wars because I mean they're at war they're killing each other surely they must dislike each other but we lack to my knowledge any sources or written sources that actually put the Persian point of view um, to provide any kind of depth or substance to this it's all assumptions at the moment 
Um, the other thing that is easy to say is that the Persians probably didn't view themselves as corrupt or tyrannical and feminine as such. I don't think any nation would go out, them, out their way to slander themselves. And I think we have to kind of take this that with the Greeks saying all this to the Persians, it probably is slander. And, you know, it's because they are at war, you know, you're never going to say, I mean, there are accounts, actually, but you're never going to hype up your opponent and be like, they are, unless, unless it's a great military victory or great importance, then you might say there is a great nation to kind of like build yourself up and be like, if they're a great nation, we are even better. But it's clear that that's not the case. And the Greek, Greeks have decided to instead say that they will be squashed and crushed because they're just not as good. So, uh, let's be honest, the Persians did not think this of themselves, they probably thought the opposite, that they were, the if they believe, if they also have the same values as the Greeks, they probably thought that they were the masculine ones and the, and the liberty-holding ones and stuff like that. They probably idolised their own culture and systems of governments just as the Greeks did their own. This is all well and good then, but what does this tell us about history? and how to better understand history. Well, it is clear from this that the Greeks started to categorise themselves and the Persians as, you know, effeminate and such, but also they looked at themselves and they categorised themselves now as Greeks, not so much individual policies. While this doesn't last too long about feeling uh, that the Greeks are Greeks and not policies, it, it does bring a question up, and that is, what makes a Greek a Greek? Because we've not seen this before. This is the first time it arrived. So it'll be interesting to see what, why why do they think they're Greeks? And what is it of that that is important for them to be Greeks? Can someone who's not a Greek be a Greek? And can someone who's Greek not be a Greek because they haven't got certain characteristics? We'll, we'll delve into this. The Greek perception of the Persians in the accounts that we have previously discussed highlights the aspects of Persian culture which the Greeks disliked and condemned. And this allows us to see what the Greeks valued in their own own culture. Like the previous course, uh, podcast, uh, we're talking about how they looked out to look in. So they're looking at the Persians to see what they don't like, to then see what the Greeks really do like. Going back to our question, though, what makes a Greek a Greek? So we see through the Greek perception of Persia that a Greek was a Greek because their social society idealised bravery, strength, masculinity, liberty, you know, the such. In other words, everything they claimed the Persians were not, thus a Greek is a Greek because they're not Persians? I'll we'll explore this. So this is obviously far too simplistic to generalise, um, as there are plenty of non-Persians who are not Greeks, but this highlights something that is a trait of humans. The desire to categorise each other via it be cultural ethnicity this time, you know, but there's also many other ways in which this could happen. I'm sure, you know, all you back home are very familiar with this. This idea is, I am Greek because I'm not something else, which is this categorising idea, is a theme that emerges throughout Greek literature, and particularly um, historical works, which we will not really have enough time to discuss now in this podcast, but it will probably crop up again in future podcasts. Um, so this then culminates into a final question, which I probably won't be able to answer, so I'm going to leave it for you guys to answer instead. So how do you categorise yourself? What are the defining qualities of your identity? And who is excluded from the group you are in? You know, these questions are hard to deal with um, and hard to answer as they deal with the core aspects of human nature uh, itself. However, it is these kind of questions that study of history and classics really seeks to answer. Um, hopefully, after a few more episodes, we might collectively be able to answer this questions as a whole as we look at different societies see how they categorize themselves and they see themselves we might get a better understanding of how society works but also when cultures clash and cultures meet how do their differences play out and is that categorization 
a really big element of it. Thank you very much everyone for listening. This concludes this episode. The Persian was are really interesting and we've gone through quite a theoretical idea of it. So if you are interested uh, in any reading on this subject or doing your own research, then I would really recommend you go and read these articles. The Impact of the Persian Wars on Classical Greece by P.J. Rhodes. And there's a brief discussion on this subject in the article Aeschylus Persians via the Ottoman Empire to Saddam Hussein by Edith Hall, which talks about the difference between Western and Eastern cultures cultures through history. And at the start, there is a bit about the Persian and the Greeks and their cultures clashing. Again, thank you very much for listening. Uh, Stay tuned for more episodes. Next time, we are going to be talking about Alexander the Great. And why was he great? Thank you very much.